we're going to be looking at Jeremiah 46 tonight. And um, there's some things I want us to, you know, we'll wait for a few minutes to, until more people can log on here. But there's some things that I want us to look at as far as life lessons. And uh, I'll, I'll set them out for you because I want you to keep them in mind as we read tonight. Hi, Tony. Blessings for you, dear friend. So in our lesson tonight, Jeremiah's message is a message of judgment. And it's actually, again, still a future thing for Jerusalem um, or for Judah uh, while they're in Egypt. It hasn't, they have the Egyptians haven't been conquered yet, but they're, they're heading there. So I'm going to set out some lessons here. I want you to think about these because in our reading, we'll look at it, okay? Um, we're going to be looking at our lesson tonight with this a few things and with these few things in mind. Number one, does it help us gain, hi Peter, does it help us gain insight about who God is and his expectations? Who God is and his expectations for his creation. Number two, scripture teaches that the Lord God chose Israel to be an example, but he really cares about all nations. And we see that in tonight's lesson, and we'll see that in the lessons forward. Here's one of the lessons that we're going to see, that God is holy and he doesn't tolerate sin. God is holy and he doesn't tolerate sin. We'll see that in our writing. God's, here's another part of his character. We're going to see that God's judgment's not based on prejudice. It's not based on favoritism. It's not based on a spirit of revenge. It's based on righteous justice. How about this one? This is one of the lessons we can look at. God does not want to bring judgment. He actually wants to bring salvation. He wants to bring salvation. And here's the last one I want us just to ponder. God's standard is the same for every human being. It's the same plumb line to which each one of us are invited to align ourselves. So at the time of our writing, Babylon and Egypt are basically the two major world powers. And you remember in our previous chapters that God told Judah that Egypt would be defeated and that they were to stay in Judah and he would take care of them there. But they made an unwise decision, basically disobedience to God's word through Jeremiah, and so they went and they actually aligned themselves with Egypt. I'm not sure, hi Ms. Donna, good to have you. I'm not sure what understanding you have about um, Egypt as a place in scripture, but it, has a, it comes with a lot of symbolism. Hi Corbs, Egypt comes with a lot of you know, symbolic meanings. And if you spend much time, you know, reading different sections about um, Egypt, we're going to see that they struggle terribly with idolatry. <laughs> I got my phone on Do Not Disturb, but there it is anyway. Um, uh, it, Egypt had the reputation of being filled with idolatry. It basically... Um, 
had the ability, Egypt as a place, had the ability to infiltrate those living in the area with idolatry. And only a few people, according to scripture, hi, Miss Diana, only a, and Miss Jane, nice, um, only a few people that ever spent time in Egypt were really spiritually strong enough to stand away from that. And, um, and so we know that uh, it would take somebody very faithful to God, very strong and faithful to God to, um, you know, to stay faithful um, during how strong the culture was in, uh, fixed into idolatry. You do remember uh, Joseph, um, you know, and he was, he, you know, was taken to Egypt. Of course, we see through all of his testing and whatever that Egypt for him was a place of testing. It was a place of, of uh, slavery. It was a place of imprisonment, but it was also a place of refuge and God used it. But Joseph remained faithful and we know that. And um, so there are just a lot associated with Egypt. And God knew the status of Egypt. He knew his people, that they were spiritually immature. And so he told them to stay in Judah and he'd take care of them there. Um, but they didn't go. So tonight we're going to open with prayer and then we'll get started. I want to look at a couple of other things um, about, um, you know, what God is actually bringing upon Judah. Now, I'm not sure how you would define these things, but I'll set them out before our prayer. Discipline, punishment, consequence. Discipline, punishment, consequence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this evening, and I just thank you for every heart uh, listening, Father. This is about us coming together, opening your word, and reading it and letting your spirit just minister to us and help us to understand things more fully. Lord, we are um, hungry for your word. We're hungry for your wisdom. We want to learn the lessons. We want to invite the spirit to help us and to teach us. And we know, Father, uh, that if we come and we humble ourselves before you and we're looking to grow and to listen and, and gain your wisdom, and then step into your ways that you are there for us. You're always going to be there for us. So thank you, Father, for this evening um, and the anointed word. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jeremiah has to give this message again to the people that have actually yoked themselves to the Egyptians, which is a negative. We just talked about that. Rather than really... Um, to either God and Judah, or even prior to that, God had said, go yoke yourself to the Babylonians. It'll be better. I'll take care of you there. He really didn't want them in Egypt. So discipline, what comes to your mind when you think of the word discipline in a biblical context? <clears throat> discipline, it involves teaching. It involves correction, but it always has a goal in mind. Basically, God's attitude behind discipline is love. He, he wants to uh, bring some discipline in order to bring some change that brings us closer to himself. And scripture says that every child of God should expect to be disciplined. He, it's, it's because he loves us. And discipline is God-given. It is a gift. And although we don't enjoy discipline when it comes most of the time, it actually, we grow to love the results because we know that we can't really do those things in our own lives. Only God can do those things. And so he brings a discipline, whatever he chooses to do, to turn us toward himself. And he does that in a very corrective, loving fashion. It's, it's really more of a tender way to steer us, discipline. Punishment, on the other hand, um, that, that's actually condemning. It's, it inflicts real suffering. Uh, the thought behind punishment is that a price has to be paid for the sins that are committed in the past. And um, the attitude about punishment really many times is anger. 
Sometimes we hear the word wrath. Um, it's about making things right and bringing justice. Scripture says that unbelievers will face punishment, but grace actually spares the believer from suffering the punishment that we actually deserve. So punishment, in, when you see the word judgment, hi, Miss Kendra, you see the word judgment, you see the word punishment, it really is, um, a, it's different than discipline because discipline is God-given, but punishment is God-inflicted. And God does not want to punish anybody. He wants everybody to turn via the discipline. But when hearts are hard, a lot of times punishment comes. And you'll have to think about that word punishment tonight and discipline and how that actually plays out as God sends his message to Judah and through Jeremiah. Um, you know, punishment... Um, will be the last word, if you will, um, at the judgment of, of, you know, at the judgment seat of Almighty God. Um, but believers will not be judged there. We will give an account for how we loved. But because of the blood of Jesus, uh, we will not face, um, we will not face the same judgment that the world will face, which is a huge gift. Um, and grace makes that possible. So the third word was consequence, right? Consequences. They're suffered in the present tense, basically. It's based on poor choices, poor actions. And sometimes God rescues us from our consequences and sometimes he does not. And sometimes it's more loving and actually adds to the benefit of the disciple to make us endure the consequences. I've had to endure consequences. Have you had to endure some consequences for bad decisions or poor choices? God could come along, he could rescue us, but he doesn't always do that. Um, just as a parent, I, I used to sit back and I, it was hard for me, but I would have to let our sons face the consequences. When we felt that, when John and I felt that they had made poor decisions, we had to allow them to face those consequences. We didn't rescue them. Um, we loved them through it, um, but it you know it was hard to do. But both John and I always knew that if we didn't allow them to face things at that level, that as God uh, loved them into adulthood, and they faced different consequences. If God didn't rescue them, they'd have to face them then, and it's better that they tasted it at a younger age and learned that making better decisions is just the answer. <laughs> so um, most of the time, uh, the consequences are self-inflicted. They're self-inflicted. So we have God-given discipline, we have God-inflicted punishment, uh, and we have self-inflicted consequences. Um, and those are all reactions to sin. So, Jeremiah 46, are you ready? I'll start reading, we'll stop, we'll, we'll start up again, we'll, we'll, we'll head in, and if you have some questions, you can go ahead and try to post them, and if not, make notes of them, and then get with me. You can email me, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, I will look for the answers if I don't know them. Verse one, the following messages were given to Jeremiah the prophet from the Lord concerning foreign nations. Messages to Egypt. Verse 2. This message concerning Egypt was given in the fourth year of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, the king of Judah, on the occasion of the battle of Carchemish, um, when Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, and his army were defeated beside the Euphrates River by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. So this would have been in the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign. This section that we're starting in 46, it begins a section that will continue through chapter 51, about, I think, 51, where Jeremiah um, pronounces judgment against the nations surrounding Judah. So one nation at a time is going to... Um, 
you know, Jeremiah will, um, you know, bring, you know, a confrontation. Uh, let's see here. Um, this is at about 605 BC when the Egyptians were overwhelmed at Carchemish. And that would be like in modern day Turkey and Syria, probably on the border there. The Babylonian armies chased the Egyptians south and, and uh, came to Jerusalem. Jeremiah puts the reader and the listener in the scene of the battle. He's very good at it. This is a really colorful writing tonight that we're going to go into. and um, So pay attention to the poetry, uh, which is vivid, uh, because much of Jeremiah's writing isn't really quite like that. The Egyptian army is described in a way that we would presume they'd be victorious, but they take a terrible turn and, um, and they are defeated. The um, Egyptian army becomes stuck um, in their own fear and they panic and they retreat. The battle can be defined as maybe punishment. Think about that word. Remember we talked about it? It was God's way to choose to correct, to purify, to call his people back to himself and then warn them not to repeat it again. It was, it was much stronger than discipline. Verse 3. Prepare your shields and advance into battle. Harness the horses and mount the stallions. Take your positions, put on your helmets, sharpen your spears and prepare your armor. But what do I see? The Egyptian army flees in terror. The bravest of his fighting men run without a backward glance. They are terrorized at every turn, says the Lord. Verse six, the swiftest runners cannot flee. The mightiest warriors cannot escape. By the Euphrates River to the north, they stumble and they fall. Who is this rising like the Nile at flood time, overflowing all the land? Verse eight, it is the Egyptian army overflowing all the land, boasting that it will cover the earth like a flood, destroying cities and their people. Charge, you horses and chariots. Attack, you mighty warriors of Egypt. Come, all you allies of Ethiopia, Libya, and Lydia. Basically, they were paid uh, foreign mercenaries who are skilled with the shield and the bow. For this is the day of the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies, a day of vengeance on his enemies. The sword, the sword will devour until it is satisfied. Yes, until it is drunk with your blood. The Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies will receive a sacrifice today in the north country besides the Euphrates River. So there you go. The Egyptians are facing God's judgment. Verse 11, go up to Gilead to get medicine. Do you ever remember that? This reminds me of this song. I just had happened to be sitting here thinking about it. The bomb, there is a bomb in Gilead. Do you remember singing that song ever in church? There is a bomb in Gilead to, uh, what was it? To save the wounded soul. There's a bomb in Gilead to uh, make the sin. I'm trying to remember how that goes. It'll come to me. But anyway, there's a bomb in Gilead. That's where it comes from. Go up to Gilead to get medicine, O virgin daughter of Egypt but your many treatments will bring you no healing. The nations have heard of your shame. The earth is filled with your cries of despair. Your mightiest warriors will run into each other and they'll fall down together. So the defeat um, of Egypt at Carchemish was famous because it marked the beginning of Babylon as the true superpower in the region and the decline of Egypt. Verse 13, then the Lord gave the prophet Jeremiah this message about King Nebuchadnezzar's plan to attack Egypt. Shout it out in Egypt. Publish it in the cities of Migdal, Memphis, and Tapanes. 
Mobilize for battle, for the sword will devour everyone around you. Why have your warriors fallen? They cannot stand, for the Lord has knocked them down, <laughs> humbled them. They stumble, they fall over each other, and they say among themselves, come, let's go back to our people, to the land of our birth. Let's get away from the sword of the enemy. There they will say, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is a loud mouth <laughs> who missed his opportunity. So some of the translations, I don't know what you have in yours for verse 17, but uh, referring to Pharaoh, one of them says braggart. He's a braggart. He boasts about his achievements, but he misses his opportunity to be victorious. And they basically, uh, the soldiers blame the king uh, for ruining the chances for victory. I guess he's only noise. Verse 18, as soon as I live, as surely as I live, I'm sorry, as surely as I live, says the king, whose name is the Lord of heaven's armies, one is coming against Egypt, who is as tall as Mount Tabor and is Mount Carmel by the sea. You know, I've been to Mount Tabor and Mount Carmel, and upon, you know, driving to those areas, they're not far from Caesarea and um, on the Mediterranean Sea, but long story short, there's, it's just like a whole area of like plains, flat areas, and out of all of this flat ground, there rises these two, these two mountains. I mean, they, they're called mountains, but they're not like the Rockies or anything like that. They're, they're just, but they're, they're definitely mountains, but they're, there they are, and you can't miss them. They're, they're obvious as all get out, right? And, um, uh, you know, like, you have to think about the fact that these are, you know, like these are tall things in this flat area. And that's the comparison. Verse 19, pack up, get ready to leave for exile, you citizens of Egypt. The city of Memphis will be destroyed without a single inhabitant. Egypt is as sleek as a beautiful heifer, but a horsefly from the north is on its way. Egypt's mercenaries have become like fattened calves. They too will turn and run, for it is a day of great disaster for Egypt, a time of great punishment. Egypt flees, silent as a serpent gliding away. The invading army marches in. They come against her with axes like woodsmen. They will cut down her people like trees, says the Lord, for they are more numerous than locusts. Verse 24, Egypt will be humiliated. She will be handed over to the people from the north. The Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, I will punish Ammon, the God of Thebes and all the other gods of Egypt. I will punish its rulers and Pharaoh too and all who trust in him. I will hand them over to those who want them killed, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and his army. But afterward, the land will recover from the ravages of war. I, the Lord, have spoken. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he towers over all the other kings right now. He has, you know, is defeating Egypt and Egypt was the only other powerful nation that could compete with him. He's overpowered Egypt now. And, you know, like uh, Mount Carmel and Mount Tabor towered over the plains. Um, the poetry of the scripture lets us know that King Nebuchadnezzar towers over all the other rulers now. And um, even Pharaoh has to bow to King Nebuchadnezzar. He wanted to serve other gods, my Pharaoh's going to have to bow to Nebuchadnezzar, who has a power, he has the power of the world. Verse 27, but do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. 
Do not be dismayed, Israel, for I will bring you home again from distant lands. Your children will return from their exile. Israel will return to a life of peace, quiet. No one will terrorize them. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, for I am with you, says the Lord. I will completely destroy the nations to which I have exiled you, but I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but with justice. I cannot let you go unpunished. So remember the life lessons that I mentioned in the front end. And for those of you who logged on after that, I'll repeat them. So in thinking about Jeremiah 46, we have the ability to gain insight about who God is and what his expectations are for his, his people, his people. And one of the things that comes to my heart is this. No matter what's going on, God is good. And he only wants good things for his children. He does come with expectations, and that's a, that seems to be a problem with people. They, they, they don't want God to have any expectations for them. They just want to make God in their image, in, in their imaginations even sometimes, and God is, you know, he's, you know, basically different for everybody in that mindset, right? And so he doesn't come with any expectations because he just loves and accepts everybody and whatever they want him to be. And that is not the truth. And it certainly is not anything you will find in scripture. God has the expectation that we will embrace his word and his ways. He's good and he wants good things for us and therefore he expects that we will run to his goodness and embrace his ways. You and I don't have any power or any ability to change who God is. He is who he is. And it's up to us whether or not to accept him the way that he really is. And he does come with those expectations. The second one was that God chose Israel to be an example, but they did not want that position. They wanted the blessing. They just didn't want to be an example in the same way that God wanted them to be an example, and they found themselves in idolatry over and over and over and over again. When you think about how difficult things were for Israel, and it's because they just continued to find themselves wandering and drifting into false ideas about who God is and false teaching and false doctrine, false, false, it's false stuff, because God uh, clearly wanted to teach Israel who he was, and what those expectations, as we said just a moment ago, would be so that they could turn around and be examples. Well, he wanted Israel to be an example because God wanted all of the other nations to watch this relationship that God had wanted with Israel and how it was supposed to work so that God could not just love Israel, but he could have a relationship with all nations. And um, now believers are to be the examples because God still cares about all nations and he wants a relationship with them. And, and so I believe Israel's coming back uh, into relationship and to recognize Messiah. But right now, um, it is the, the church, it is the believers who are to carry that torch of knowing God 
and loving God for who he is and embracing his wisdom and his ways that's found in the word and to be led by the spirit of the living God. And we are to be the example so that other people will want that, other nations will want that. And, um, and we want, you know, like when our heart is right with God, we want people to know how good God is. And yet we have no, no I have zero desire to try to change God because it's not going to happen anyway. But I don't, I mean, like I already, I mean, like I have sat back before and thought to myself, you know what? It's utter arrogance to think that for some reason God needs to come and agree with us versus the other way around. Come on. We need to get into agreement with God. And eventually, either through discipline, punishment, or just facing horrible consequences, we're going to figure that out. The third thing was that God is holy, and he doesn't tolerate sin. You know, God's holiness requires our holiness. If we're going to have a relationship with him, who, he who is holy, we're going to have to embrace Jesus who is perfection of holiness and let him teach us and to bring us into that place with Almighty God. But it means that our lives need to grow in the holy character of Jesus. He makes that happen. We have to agree with it and allow it, but he makes that happen. And we need to be on that path because God is a holy. And he wants, he says that in scripture from the very beginning. I'm holy, be holy. <laughs> Nothing that's changed. Jesus still says it today. I'm holy, be holy. And uh, we need to, you know, be willing to walk into that. So that's a life lesson that we need to pay attention to that all the time with how we live our lives. God is calling us into holiness because he's holy and he's just trying to get that good, that every good thing to us. The fourth thing I mentioned at the very beginning was God's judgment or punishment is not based on prejudice, favoritism, nor a spirit of revenge. It's based on his righteous rule. So we, we say this a lot as Christians, Lord, you know, bring your kingdom to earth and rule here. And what we're actually saying and affirming and praying for is for uh, the world to become righteous. Well, how do we think that's going to happen? It's going to happen because God brings those three things that we talked about. And not everybody is going to want to be under Christ's rule. Evil certainly doesn't want to. It continues to try to rule, doesn't it? It's a constant, it's a constant spiritual battle right now between good and evil. I feel it. I don't always see it, but I always feel this pressure of uh, spiritual warfare, and I certainly see the evidence of it played out. People are not uh, evil, but there's a spirit of evilness that occupies and lives in, in people when they allow it. And so there's just all kinds of stuff going on all the time, and I just sense it that, you know, like it's always this evil inclination against the righteousness of Almighty God. And, and it's a fight. Who will be the ruler? Who will be the ruler of this world? <laughs> Who's it going to be? You know, when we look at the politics right now, we sit back and go like, oh my gosh, it's about politics. No, it isn't. It's a spirit that is rampant. And, and it's just all over the place. And in no one party. Just for the record, has it right. So we know Jesus has it right, but it's just a constant battle. 
Everybody, from the beginning of time, from the Garden of Eden, it has been about a power struggle. It's just escalating. And it goes through cycles in history, we see it. And, um, you know, and eventually people just, they just hate anything that has power or has any more power than them. And so there's just a battle. There's just gonna be a battle. And it's a wrong spirit versus a submissive spirit to Almighty God. So the fifth thing we talked about, so that was about God's um, judgment or punishment. Whoever comes against God is going to face those things. He's gonna, they're gonna face you know, discipline, punishment, um, or the consequences of sinful behavior. The fifth thing was God does not want to bring judgment. He wants to bring salvation. I think that's, you know, so evident in, in John 3, 15, 3, 16, 3, 17, is it? Um, you know, that God didn't come into the world to condemn it. He came to save it. You know, he, he wants to save the world and he wants to save people and hearts from the divisive and enslaving process of evil. We have to know that he, his highest is always salvation. So when even dif, whenever difficult things are going on in our world and right now, um, we see it in a lot of different directions. But if you think about it this way, nothing comes into a believer's life that hasn't first gone through the cross of Jesus Christ because Christ lives in us. And we have to know that he, is, he has a plan and if we face difficult things, he will give us the grace to um, navigate through it and, and to learn from it because everything's a lesson. I don't care what anybody says. Everything is a lesson. It's even blessings are lessons. There are lessons that we need to learn and we need to pay attention to and what God desires for us. But we always have to have this in mind right up, right in front. He loves us. He, he has a perfect love for us. And his greatest desire is to see us come into that place of salvation where he speaks and we listen and we walk it out. And anything other than that, it's going to, we're going to face difficulties. And even with that, the enemy will come against us because the enemy does not want us to be obedient to our Heavenly Father. He will fight that. Satan will fight that all the time. So we have to stay the course. You know, we, we kind of live in Egypt, don't we? The place, the place, when we think about that. Uh, there's, it's a place of refuge, but it's also a place of, of, of um, testing. A, always a place of testing. And, and we live in the world, but we're not of the world. So there's, we feel that constant clashing together of, of spirits. And um, God wants to save us and he wants to save the world, but he leaves us here to be those examples. And much of the time, I think as Christians, we forget the magnitude or the weight um, of wearing that and how we treat people and how we speak and how we, um, you know, reflect our Heavenly Father, our Savior, our Lord um, to them um, because we need to be people who have such respect for God that we are just, we put on love and we keep going. And we keep going no matter what. Because we trust him. And the last thing we talked about and those life lessons, there were six of them. Here's number six. God's standard is the same for every human being. It's the same plumb line to which we must align. Now, I know the world wants to sit back and go like Jesus was this and he was that and blah, blah, blah. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. He is God in the flesh. He, he, he came and he laid his life down 
and he is almighty God. And he is our plumb line. He's yours, he's mine, he's each one of us. And he tells us that we are to, if we love him, we will follow his commands. Love God with our whole heart. He narrowed all, the, he narrowed the Ten Commandments down to, to saying basically it falls into two, like the two greatest commands, and that is to love God with your whole, just your whole being, right? Just, and then turn to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And in the light of that, if we will keep those two things in mind all the time, we will fulfill the commands of God, his commands of love. And that is the standard to embrace and accept Jesus as Lord of our lives and to live by those commands. That's how we know that we belong to Christ and Christ uh, is within us. So when thinking about this passage, I was thinking about several um, New Testament scriptures about discipline and um, whatnot. So just if you have your pencil, just write a couple of these down. All right, Hebrews 12, 9 through 11. Hebrews 12, 9 through 11. I have, I think I looked up the um, a different translation of it, probably ESV, but I'll read it off from here and you can look it up in whatever translation you like, but Hebrews 12, 9 through 11. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. When we spend time in the Word, we are being trained by righteousness, and we have an opportunity to apply it to our lives in practical ways. Sometimes people say, well, I don't know how to do that, Mary. Well, however God lays it on your heart is how you do it. The, you either believe that you have the work of the Holy Spirit within you and that Holy Spirit leads and guides you. I'm not going to be trained in the same way that you're going to be trained, not because mine's better or yours is better. God knows who I am. He knows my weaknesses. He knows my strengths. He knows my level of devotion. He knows my level of love. He knows my level of submission and surrender. He knows. And so he's going to discipline me and he's going to bring different things to my heart. And I have to be listening all the time for what he wants me to learn um, from everything that I taste. Remember I started off and early on and I said I went you know, to Acura, and it's been like the most frustrating thing to get a new key fob. How hard is it to get a new key fob? Well, I can tell you, it's two phone calls, it's two trips, it will be a third trip before I probably get a key fob, and then even then, they may have to reprogram the thing in the car. So I might as well just put a smile on my face and accept the fact that they're gonna use some of my time and I'm just gonna be, uh, you know, that, I'm gonna be Mary Mary. I'm gonna be Mary Mary. I am gonna be happy. I'm not going to be cross with them. I'm gonna endure it, right? Do I, do you know that I made two phone calls and never bothered to call me back? And I laughingly said to John, my word, you know, like, I talk to somebody and they say, oh, they'll call you right back leave a voicemail, I leave a voicemail, nobody calls me back. <laughs> Second day, rerun, same thing, same combat. I, have, I said to him, I'm like, but um, I, you know, like I left in a voicemail, oh yeah, no, they'll get to you this time. They will get, they never did. You know, so you and I have to get to the point where we see these kinds of things as God's discipline, that he is forging us for us to see, okay, 
you're not going to ruin my day. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, right? We say that every time we get together for worship. How many times do you say that when, you know, life's pressing you or you know the Lord is bringing a little bit of an endurance test and it's a bit of a discipline for you because God says, hey, if just everything's going, you know, smooth, you're not going to really get toughened up. One time I said, God, you know, like, haven't I just like tasted enough stuff for a while, right? I just don't, <laughs> do I have to go through more stuff, you know? And, and, he, and the spirit of God just kind of laid in my heart. Yeah, because I'm trying to make you strong, girl. You know, the world's mean and you need to toughen up. And, and, I, and I do, I, honestly, I do. I have to say that probably I'm a lot stronger than I ever thought. I could be. Maybe that's your testimony too. But can I tell you that unless God does a work in you, if you're that like soft, tender-hearted kind of an individual, and unless God takes you through some stuff, you stay too tender. And you'd think that would be what God wants, but he doesn't. He wants us to be tender to him, right? And resistant to evil, to where it just doesn't phase us in the same way. And that's real strength of character. That's really, that's really the character of Jesus. Yeah, girl, you got that right. You guys just saying that, didn't you? Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. And we're going to look at waiting this Sunday because, well, and tomorrow night too, I'll be teaching on, but there is this strength that God wants to groom in each one of us where we do not quit because the world gives up way too or easy you know the the worldly culture they give in to all kinds of stuff and god's kids have got to go like mm -mm, not doing it i'm going to stay in that righteous place with god he's going to be my protector he's going to uh, watch over my life. I'm just going to trust him with every aspect of it. I'm going to stand and see the salvation of the Lord in my life because he's, he's offered that to me. That is true salvation. And we have to find um, a way to not only accept his discipline, but to be grateful for it, to be grateful for even the testing times because it is making us stronger as his children. He's looking for sons and daughters. You know, if you and I are deciding that we want to be led by the spirit of the living God, that's what a son and daughter is, according to scripture. Those who are led by the spirit are sons and daughters. They're not children. They're, they're, they're growing. They're getting mature. And they have to be tough. They have to be tough. And not harsh. It's different. They just have to be like, um, we just stand with our shield of faith and we are not swayed one way or the other from being devoted to God. We are to be devoted. That's what he's asked us. That's actually his expectation. So another scripture real quick. We got a couple of minutes. Um, first Corinthians eleven thirty two. maybe just make a note of that and you look at, um, whatever translation that you like to read, maybe look at that one too. Um, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. There's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to worry about being condemned by God. If you know Jesus, you will not be condemned and you will be disciplined, which is different. Um, Romans, uh, Romans 2, um... You might read verses 1 through 29. I'm not going to go into that one, but look up that one. Romans 2, 1 through 29. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus says this, The Lord, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. 
So discipline is to bring that repentant heart that says, I'm not going to fight you. I'm going to go and align myself with you. And I'm going to get into agreement. I'm not going to turn from you. I'm turning to you. And the consequences one. Remember I said that it's discipline, it's punishment, it's consequences. Well, I thought this was an interesting thought process from Galatians 6, 7, but I'll just summarize it and you look it up later. There is a sowing and a reaping that goes on and it's, it's a spiritual law. God says, as long as the earth remains, this spiritual law is going to be in effect. Whatever you sow, you will reap. And that is where we get our consequences, right? Whatever we sow, we're, we're going to reap from that. When we sow into unrighteous actions, when we sow into rebellious behaviors, we reap from those things. And the same thing goes in, in the blessing. When we are sowing into that blessing, when we're sowing into the work of love, when we're, you know, pushing, uh, uh, you know, that, that spirit of generosity out there and we are just like extending ourselves in righteous ways, then we reap in spiritual abundance. You know, it's a lot of times, you know, I talk to people about, um, what's important to me. And I, you know, I, I pray and I ask God for things a lot, but it's not the things that most people would think. The things I ask for are spiritual insights and blessings, spiritual things. Um, not because I couldn't use some more stuff, but I don't really need anything. I want spiritual blessings. I want spiritual revelation and insight. And so when I'm asking, you know, God for things, that tends to be the weighted portions that I ask for. I always sit back and I think, you know, I could ask for all kinds of things. And I do ask God to protect my family. And don't get me wrong. I, but it's just... I really do want those things, and I want them for all God's people. So I pray not only for myself, but for all believers everywhere to have this insight and this desire um, to enjoy more of God. And another prayer that I sow into is that I want to look at sin as very sinful. I don't want to minimize sin. If God says, Mary, you have this sin in your life, I want to really grow to hate that sin so that I don't feed it. You know, my mother used to say it this way, Oh Lord, make sin exceedingly sinful to me. I don't want to trivialize or become desensitized to sin. Sin is sin and God calls it. I don't call it, he calls it. And so when he calls it and he says, this is sin, this is, you know, this cannot abide within you. You cannot keep going. If this is in you, we have to deal with it, whether it's insecurity or whatever it is, um, then he means it. And, you know, and so I say, God, you know, help me to see that as really ugly so that I don't feed that, you know, help me to see it as sin and very, very sinful. And the last one I wanted you to maybe make a note of is Matthew 12, 36 through 37. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you'll be justified. And by your words, you'll be condemned. I mean, Jesus was talking to um, unbelievers. So, you know, we need to pay attention to all those things too, right? So. All right, well, I'm hoping that you were blessed. I want you to think further about discipline, punishment, and consequences. 
and I know that you will. And if you have other thoughts about Jeremiah or any of the things that we covered, just get with me. All right. I hope I'll see some of you tomorrow night at worship or Sunday at worship. Um, just check the website and I, I pray a blessing over you. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for all that you're doing to teach us. We need to learn. Help us to be diligent in our learning and help us to stay the course and not drift from the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, blessings. Good night.